Hi guys. Thank you so much for staying up for the last talk for the day. Uh, so this happens to be my third talk. Actually fourth if you count uh, meta refresh. And I think year on year JSFU has been going awesome and more and more awesome. So a big cheer to the Hasgeek team and I think to the entire community as such. Right. And I really appreciate the minute details that you guys get into and keep improving every single year. So that's awesome. Okay. So talking about demand driven applications primarily with GraphQL. I tend to think there are three big problems when it comes to doing web development, right? The first two you've probably already heard of, which is cache invalidations and naming variables. And I'd like to add a third item to that, which is adhering to JSON contracts. And the reason why I say that is because pretty much in most of the engagements that I've been a part of, the JSON contracts that we agree upon at the start never seem to be the same when it project goes live. Things keep changing over and over, and that's not a great thing. And that essentially leads up to this whole situation of where the API tends to become a bottleneck for us. So if you look at it, uh, you have the data layer and you have the experience layer. So data layers where you have all your databases, all of them being powered by microservices. And you have the experience layer that's being built on your Angulars, your Reacts, and the Vue.js's of the world, and the mobile applications on Swift and maybe Kotlin nowadays. So these of them keep moving at a great pace. And it's the API layer's job in the middle to try and make sure that the data that's coming from the data layer is massaged and represented in the right way that your experience layer can see it on the top. And that's where things don't work very well. And the, the API layer is also where a couple of problems keep on occurring. So the first one is, like I said, your APIs keep changing. And changing an API is never a good thing for anybody. Every time new features get added in and you want to change an API, your front end, there's a very good chance your front end applications can break. And to sort of avoid that, what you'll end up doing is you sort of versioning your APIs. And when you version your APIs, you'll end up having to maintain a whole bunch of APIs with just small incremental changes over. The other thing is network latency. And I think network latency is the one that sort of affects the most to your API layer. And, and that is more pronounced when it comes to mobile. And, and that's primarily because of the way cellular networks work, right? So every additional request that you're making to an API, uh, the amount of payload that it downloads or the amount of time that it takes, or the, it actually puts in a lot of slowness to the loading of your app. So network latency is one of the biggest factors that affects your API layer. And the last one is documentation. Uh, the way REST works, the way we build our REST APIs, nothing is, the whole API is of no use unless you have documentation that tells you what APIs to hit and what data to get back on. So those are a couple of challenges that you'll end up facing with your APIs. And the whole idea of demand-driven architecture is to sort of minimize some of those problems and make life a little better. Uh, so before we get into that, just a quick look at how traditionally we have been working. So if you look at it, we obviously nowadays work in a component-based architecture, right? You have a parent component and a couple of child components under them. And the parent component is usually the one that goes, makes a network request, gets back a big chunk of JSON, takes the data that it wants to render, renders that, passes the data further down to the child components, and each of those child components render the data. So they pick up the data that they want to see, render it up. A lot of data gets wasted, unnecessary information which you do not get to use. At the same time, certain components need some data which they haven't got from the parent components. And what they'll end up doing is then they go and make another network call, get that data in, and render. So that's essentially how most of the applications that we build nowadays work. And uh, which is fine. But you know, if you look at it, your components are sort of doing pretty mundane things. You know, there's no smart intelligence over there. You get the data, I just render it. And that's probably the other reason why you call them as dumb components. I know they call dumb components for a different reason, but you know, the way we build our applications are pretty much rather dumb. When it comes to demand driven, things work a little differently. So here, every component knows that this is the data that I want to display. And the component will make a request to the parent saying, hey, I need to display this component. Give me these three or four fields that I need. And that goes to my parent component. And that in turn goes to the root component. And the root component will collate all the data fields that, it, that all the child components need, makes one network call to the top, gets the data in, and renders all the data back down. And what happens with that is every component gets exactly the data that they asked for, which means not more, not less, which is a very efficient uh, on the network for us. 
So that's how one of the primary principles of the way demand driven architecture works. Right? And GraphQL is one of the tools that works on this principle. And if you ask me what GraphQL is, basically just three things that you need to keep in mind. One, it's a query language for your API. Two, it runs on the server. So it's a server set runtime and it uses a type system. So that's three basic things you want to keep in mind. And while you're talking on this, you also want to know what GraphQL is not. Because there's a lot of confusion around it, people tend to misunderstand it. So just want to couple, throw out a couple of points out there. So for one, it's not a database. Things like graph databases like Neo4j is a graph database. GraphQL does not store any kind of a data. It's a transfer protocol. It's a client side state, it's not a client side state management library. Just because it was made by Facebook does not mean it is limited to only being used with React and Relay. And actually, it's not even just limited to JavaScript and the Node world. It's much bigger than that. And finally, it's got nothing to do with Facebook's social graph. I had people coming up and asking me, so, you know what, I, we build enterprise-based applications, and we got nothing, we don't need Facebook friends, we don't need friends of friends and likes, so can we still use GraphQL? And I was like, of course you can use GraphQL. It's got nothing to do with social graph. So these are a couple of things that GraphQL is not. So what exactly is GraphQL? So when Facebook decided to launch GraphQL, they simply pushed it out as a set of specifications of how queries should be written. And that's all that they did. They did launch a small uh, reference application on top of that, but the main thing that Facebook owns for GraphQL is the specifications. And what that did to the community is every community went and picked up the specifications and built a GraphQL server on their own favorite languages. And by that, now we have got GraphQL servers available in pretty much every possible language that's out there. So which means you do not have to know JavaScript to use a GraphQL server. If you work with Scala, Haskell, Ruby, you can work with GraphQL. In addition to that, you also have a couple of client libraries that use GraphQL. These are optional. You may choose you want to use them. It makes life a little easier, but otherwise you can just write plain vanilla JavaScript. So Relay and Apollo are a couple of clients that are a lot more popular in the space. How does a GraphQL topology look like? So you have your bottom, uh, you know, your databases, you've got your uh, order management systems, your inventory and all of that. All the data from that is being powered up by microservices. And then you have a GraphQL layer that is sitting on top of that, which is essentially doing the plumbing over there. So you take data from all these data points and GraphQL creeps one, builds one big schema over there. And your front-end application, whether it's Angular, React, or if it's a native app built on Swift, or say maybe native script, all of them hit one single endpoint. There's only one endpoint that all of them hit to get the data back. So you don't need to know what are the various APIs that are there. I don't need to know what is the parameters that I'm going to receive, nothing. I just need, I just work with one single endpoint. So that's the beauty of GraphQL. Uh, so the way GraphQL works is, so as I said, every component defines their data needs. So here I have a component that says, I need name, email, address, whatever. I simply create a JSON object of that, send it to GraphQL, and GraphQL respond back to me with the JSON object, with the data filled in. And what comes with GraphQL is a very nice interface called graphical, wherein, you know, you can live, sorry, in pretty much live mode, write your queries and see how the responses look like. I'm going to try and show you a couple of examples of this. So like I said, graphical is a very nice interface for building, uh, for testing a GraphQL. And there's also something called Launchpad, which you can access it at launchpad.graphql.com. So this allows you to write, build a JSON schema, build your queries, and actually see the live results. So think of it like JSBin, but for GraphQL. So you have a left interface wherein you create your schemas. And in the center pane is where you write your queries. And on the right hand side is where you'll get to see the outputs of these queries. So I have a couple of uh, pads created that we can just look at. Let me switch to. Better now? Yeah, better for everybody? Okay. So 
So at the heart of GraphQL is something called the GraphQL schema. So this is where, like I said, you do the plumbing work. You know, all the data comes from the deep, from your APIs. You, you keep them all concentrated in the center, and you create your various fields that are there out there. And your front-end application will simply ask for these fields. And inside a JSON schema, there are just primarily two basic things. One is the fields, and the second one is what the field should resolve to. So if you look at this particular thing, these are a set of fields that I have. So let's look at the first field. There's one field called hello, and it's of type string. So like I said, GraphQL is a type system. So every field that you define, you have to define what the type that goes along with it. And for this field called hello, I have a resolver function. And a resolver function is nothing but a JavaScript function. And inside that, I could do whatever I want. So for the hello function, I simply say, respond back with a hello world. And if I have to build my GraphQL query, I will write uh, hello. So that's my field name. And if I run it, it should respond back with a hello world. If I wanted to respond back with something else, I just change the parameters here. So let's see. JS4 rocks. And it would update my field on my right panel. So that's the output over there. And you'll see that the value has changed to JS4 rocks. So it's as simple as that. Let's look at the next example where you have a field called show cities. So, so the field is called show cities. What it returns back is actually an array of strings. And in my resolver, I'm simply returning back an array of strings out here. So if I go in and say show cities, and you notice graphical is doing an autocomplete. So you know, it makes life a lot easier for all of us. And if I run that, I probably get an array of cities over there. So that's my second field. So you can create fields that respond back with integers, scalar values like strings, booleans, floats. You can also respond it back with a string. This is a third type of field that I've created. It says get area. It takes in an input of a radius whose type is integer and it runs back a float. Very simple thing. And in my resolver, I essentially have a formula that calculates a radius of a circle. So if I have to try this out, so I say get area and I say radius and I give a radius of say two and I should get my radius over here. So GraphQL at the core of it is very, very simple. A field and a resolver function, which is nothing but a JavaScript function, and do whatever you want inside the JavaScript function. And whatever is the resolving value comes back as a response to the field that you requested for. That's, that's the whole base of GraphQL. And if you look at it, it's so easy that you, know, you can actually start seeing how you can start mocking it, how you can use it for mocking data. Because clearly, when you're building front-end applications, your APIs are never ready, right? How many times are you in situations where you're building a front-end application and your API is 100% ready? Very rarely. Your APIs are never there. Your contracts are there, yes. Your JSON contracts are there. You agree on the contracts, you take them, put them into static JSON files, and go and start building your entire front-end. Your applications are very close to going live. Your APIs are still not ready. And by the time your APIs come in ready, they're different from the contracts that you have. It gets very frustrating. And I think that's where GraphQL's beauty comes in because that solves a problem for you. So one, it's a very, sorry? Searching for my iPad. That's an example of mocking. So I set up a GraphQL server, I define my data types, and I say, hey, these are my data types, and this is how my schema is going to look like. That's all that I need. I don't need to care about anything. Now, because GraphQL knows that every field is associated with a certain type, it knows what to respond back with. So if it's an integer, it's going to respond back to you with a random number. If it's a string, it's going to respond back with a hello world. So that's how you can do that. And that's a small library that actually does it for you. So over here, there's a small module which says add mock functions to schema. It's available as a part of the GraphQL tools. So once you import that in, mocking capability is available for you. Over here, I can go in and try. So I've got a couple of queries. And you, know, you can see that I've just named the query. So I say, got a query called with a name called author. Maybe I can go and run that. So if I go and run author, on the right-hand side, you see that responses have come up. So that's all mocked data. So wherever there's an integer field, 
it will respond back with a random number. If it's a string, it's going to respond back with the hello world because that's what my module is providing me right now, which sometimes isn't very great. You know, I want to have a little more realistic looking data or I want to get more control over my mock data. I can probably do that. So thankfully, I can go in here and I can define that if it's an integer, respond back with a triple one in this particular case. So if you notice, now wherever there's an integer, it will show up as triple one. Maybe I can go in and add a age field over here. Let's see if that works. So age will also show up as a triple one. If I want to define a certain string, simple enough. So that's my custom string that's going to show up now for every string value that's there in the system. If I want to get a little more creative, I can actually get rid of that and do something pretty crazy. It's like in the string, because it's a function, I say I create an array of random strings and I randomly assign a single string to any random value that's showing up over there. So every time there's a string, it'll randomly pick up a, an element from the array and show it up over there. So that's how you can start go about customizing your mock data. But you can do even better. There's a very nice library out there called Casual. It's a nice NPM module called Casual. You can input the Casual module in, and what Casual does is it creates very realistic looking fake data for you. So, yeah. So I can input Casual in, and over here, say for example, if it's my user object, I'm just going to go and disable that. And come in this code out, and I say, get me a real looking name and get me a real looking age. So if you see, you got a nice name called Mrs. Jonathan Shinner, and the age is 48. And the reason the age is 48 is because I've defined that I want the age to be a number between 18 to 75. So, so that's casual for you. I can even go ahead and give an address field, and when I want, I want a street name, I want a city, and you actually get random names of the cities and all of that. So this makes it a really functional mocking server for you. Use this, get started, go and build your entire application. So now your schemas are set in. Tomorrow when your APIs are ready, all you need to do is just go back and add your resolvers to each of the fields. Your fields do not change, right? They should ideally never change. Your fields do not change. And if your fields don't change, all the front-end applications that you build, your mobile apps and native apps, they're all going to, and even your React apps, they're all going to work as is. It's just that the resolver is what you're going to change and do the plumbing over there. So you can take a mocking server and take it to production without having to discard anything away. So that's another classic example of how GraphQL can actually help quite a bit. Going back. So there are three types of operations that you can do with GraphQL. The first one is a query, which are essentially reads, and that's what you saw. The other one, so that's how a, a GraphQL query would look like. You essentially pass an object, these are the three fields I want, it responds back with those three fields. The second, are mutations. So mutations are where, where you go and update records. So these are write operations. And in a mutation, you pass the parameters that you want to change, and you pass the parameters that GraphQL should respond back with after the change has happened. And they could be different. They don't have to be the same. In this example, because they're likes, I'm just responding back with the like. But I could say, update the likes, but respond back to me with the name of the product that is there. That will still work. The third, is subscriptions, and I think that's one of the coolest features here. So subscriptions allows you to do real-time reads on specific fields, and they keep listening to certain mutations. So every time a mutation happens, the subscription will trigger, and those fields will start showing up. Now, from a query standpoint, they're pretty much similar to the way you work with a, a read query, but things start to change on the server side. So, uh, so I think till about a few months back, the specs for the subscription were still in draft mode, and they were not fully released but the Apollo team went ahead and kind of released a, full, a fully featured version of subscriptions on the Apollo server, and that's primarily based on WebSockets. So if you want to use subscriptions in your application, you need to do a little more. You know, for queries and mutations, it's just about going and adding a resolver function and you're all set. But with subscriptions, you'll have to go about setting up a small uh, subscription endpoint. You need to set up a subscription endpoint, and you need to set up WebSockets. So this is on your express side. You need to write this before code, additional. And in your resolver, you'll have to use PubSub. 
So user pops up to keep listening to an event of a mutation, and every time that mu event mutation is happening, it's going to go about updating the fields. So for me, if you ask me, I think subscription solves a lot of modern day problems that we have faced, right? So just to, so one of my pet peeves is this, you know, we live in a tabbed world. We have like 30, 40 tabs opened up in a browser, and out of which seven or eight tabs belong to the same application that we have. Like, we work on GitHub. I work on GitHub pretty often, and I'm working on a repo. I got a bunch of PRs, I got a bunch of issues. They're all opened up in different tabs. I've grown, closed a couple of issues, merged a couple of PRs, and my damn count is different on every single tab, right? So the um, count, count of open tick issues is very different, and it gets very frustrating. So I need to keep refreshing each tab to make sure that my counts are all same. Same is a thing with e-commerce, right? Uh, I've got four or five different product pages opened up. I've added a couple of them to the cart, and my cart, the items in cart number is not the same across different tabs. And, and I think that's where subscriptions can actually come in and solve that problem for you. So this is a small example that one of my colleagues built in. Shalini, is Shalini around here? Ah, okay. I don't know. I think she's left. But so Shalini's a, a very young colleague of ours, and you know, I kind of helped her out with GraphQL and said, hey, can you help me build with something with subscriptions? And she came up with this domain in a couple of days. So what this is, is a product listing on the left-hand side, and it's a cart on the right-hand side. And you've got subscriptions enabled for your items to cart and your cart page. So every time a product is getting added to the cart, your sub things should start popping up over here without having you to do a refresh. It's a video of that. So you just add to cart immediately, it shows up on your cart page. And the count is also changing on the top. So now your browser tabs are all synced with each other. So that's a small video of how subscription can work in. Moving on. Query fragments, I think another cool thing about GraphQL. So if you remember at the start, I talked about uh, how you have queries, uh, how every component can make a demand of the data that it needs, and it will pass it up to the parent. In GraphQL, you do that with something called the query fragment. And if you look at an example over here, on the top is probably like a card component, uh, a profile tile, you can call it as. So you got a profile pic, you got the name, and some information on what the status is and how long have they been a member. So all the data is now created as a fragment, and that fragment will simply define that, hey, this fragment is called public profile. It's on type of the user, type of person, and it's got a name field, profile field, status, and a message. And then you also have another component called the billing component, billing address component, which defines that I need the street address, I need my city, I need my state, and my zip code, so on and so forth. So every component, I just define the fragment of the data that is required for that component. And then what happens is, on the parent level, using a simple spread operator, these fragments are pulled in, and your entire uh, query is built. So again, a simple example for this. So on my left-hand side is the whole GraphQL schema. It's got all the information about the user, first name, last name, display, about blah, 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 every single thing. And what I've done in my query is I simply create small fragments. So this is my public profile information, which simply shares display name and avatar. And I've got my private profile, which got more information with things like email, my billing address, and stuff like that. And then depending on what page I'm going to query from, I define what data should I be pulling in. If it's going to be my personal profile page, logged in profile page, I want to pull in both my data. If it's just my public profile, then I'm just going to pull in my public profile information. So if I query profile page, I will probably get all the information in. So data from my public profile and also from my personal profile. And if I query only public profile, I get only those two data points in. And now because these are fragments, I can just go in and I can, so, so for example, I know, I know this component is being used in like five or 20 different places. And now your project manager comes in and says, hey, you know what, just can you just add this one additional field over there? 
which essentially means you need to go and add it in all the different places, not only the component, but also the component is probably in the same place, but the API that's being using, we'll have to make sure that that fields are available all over there. But now with query fragments, I just need to do it at one place. So I could just define it over here, and every single place where this fragment is being used will automatically pull up that additional information of members since. And that's all uh, casual, by the way. That's casual mock data that's out there. So right from date and everything can be pulled in. So that's GraphQL fragments for you. Okay, so, so these are a couple of good things about GraphQL. Uh, there are a couple of not so good things about GraphQL. And the first one is uh, the classic n plus one query problem. Uh, so the way GraphQL is structured, right, every resolver function runs asynchronously, asynchronously within a promise, what can happen due to that is the same record can be hit multiple times. So the n plus one problem is where you've got multiple queries hitting the same record and returning back with the same result. And that happens very often with GraphQL. So if you see this example over here, I got a list of friends and I got a best friend for each of those friends. And there's obviously a combination possibility that, that my best friend is somebody else's best friend also. And when I run a query like this, what happens is on the network is, or on the database is going to make all these calls and it will realize that the person with an ID 2 is getting called multiple times, which is essentially not a very good thing. And that's a problem that happens very often with GraphQL. And I can probably show that with a small demo. So, start off one server. So the same example that we saw, put it up in GraphQL, I got a list of friends and showing the, I'm trying to get the name of the best friend and also my friend's best friend. So when I run that, I get to see a bunch of names. And you'll obviously notice that some names are duplicating over here. So Shailesh, for example, is the best friend for a lot of people. So his name shows up here multiple times. And on the database, what's happening is that particular ID is getting called multiple times, and that's the problem. So to solve this, you have something called a data loader. So this is a very small library that Leigh Byron put together. Apparently, it's like, I mean, the, he and his, one of his friends sort of pair programmed and wrote it in a coffee shop, and it's just about 300 plus lines of code. So very small library, but this sort of solves the whole problem of our n plus one. And it does it in two ways. It based, so your data loader basically does just two simple things. It does batching of all the queries, and secondly, it does caching of the records that have already been queried for, right? And if I have to go and enable this in my application, reasonably simple, I would go in, import my data loader in, and I also obviously create a new data loader instance. And then in my queries, where I'm simply doing a very regular find by, I'm going to route it via my data loader. So I'll just save it. And I run my same query again. I get the same results, which is great. But the good thing also is, just like one network call now. So only one call went into the database for the data. So at the most, you just get one or two calls, not more. So that's data loader, and I think if you're using GraphQL on the server, you should definitely give this a consideration. The next thing is, uh, so a, a lot of, a question that keeps coming up very often is, how do you do authentication and authorization with GraphQL? And I think the plain and simple answer to that is you don't. So uh, as per the specs and as per the guidelines, it's recommended that you do not do any kind of authentication in the GraphQL layer, but uh, you kind of do it above and below. So just to get everybody on the same page, authorization and authentication is likely two different things, right? Authentication is where you want to validate whether the user who's coming in is a genuine user or not. So if the person is a genuine user, then let them even access the API. If they're not a genuine user, just return back with an error and don't even let them touch the API. So that's authentication. Authorization, on the other hand, is you want to check whether the person who is making that transaction, is he authorized to make the transaction or not? 
So, it could be like, you know, if you're an admin, then you're able to make right changes to certain fields. If you're not an admin, then you're only able to read. So, that's authorization. And the recommendation is that you separate them out and you do it this way. So, you have authentication on the top, so it's sort of in your express layer or in your server side layer. And once that is, uh, and once your authorization layer is there and the, per the request that's coming in is valid, then it goes through your GraphQL layer, which is transparent, doesn't do anything. And then it goes and checks on your authorization, which is essentially sitting on your business logic or in a database layer. And then if that's valid, then you allow or disallow certain transactions to happen. So that's essentially the recommended practice that how you recommend using, using authorization and authentication with GraphQL. If you're using Node and Express, very standard tools, you can use Passport, you can use the JWT tokens, you can use Bicrypt, the standard things that you do. So they're all on the Express layer that's there. GraphQL, you do not want to ideally do that. Having said that, you can do it if you really want to do it, but the recommendation is that you do not, should ideally not do that. So that's about it. Okay, quickly. Uh, let's try and play a small game. <laughs> so this is an application that we kind of built together. Uh, it uses Angular on the front end, because Angular is an awesome app, yes? And uh, it uses GraphQL, which is a hosted version of the GraphQL server. And app is very simple, essentially shows you a bunch of libraries, go click on it, and just vote for a library. Uh, it, it has all three implemented in it, so it is using queries to read the list of uh, libraries and show it to you. There is a mutation, so every time you click on a star, it goes and mutates the value of that particular object, and with subscriptions, it will keep sorting and making sure that the, the library with the most number of stars comes first. It's on Firebase and it's using free GraphQL, so not sure how much of traffic or load it's gonna take, but let's give it a shot. So that's the URL. If you guys can just open up your mobile phones and try and uh, hit it, bit.ly slash git hyphen stars. A quick look at that. So bit.ly slash git hyphen stars, that's the URL. Open it up on your mobile phone. You see a bunch of libraries, oh, sorry. Yep, get stars. So go ahead and start voting it. And if my subscriptions and if my servers hold up, hopefully we'll see these the library is opening up. And you can try and see if they're in staying in sync with what you are clicking and what I'm getting to see. Yeah. Okay. View is moving forward. Nice to see Angular out there. Where's React? Ah, React is 12. Okay. Yay, Angular move forward. Okay. Maybe another minute and then we can just stop it. So, yeah, so anyway, that's a small demo out there and the code base is also available on bit.ly slash git hyphen stars hyphen code. Essentially take it to a GitHub URL, you can go and play with it. Like I said, it uses Angular 4 uh, with AOT and uses GraphQL in the backend. So that was about it for the demo. And so I never miss an opportunity to give public service announcements at JS4. So, uh, so I think we as a community are extensive users of open source. Pretty much every tool that we use, every library that we use is open source. Our NPM projects, are, you know, our NPM modules have anywhere around 800 to 900 modules in, and all of them are free, right? So we're huge consumers of open source. And I think it's sort of time for us to start contributing back to the open source community. And you can do that in every possible way, very small, small things. You know, obviously you can raise issues over your various libraries that you're working on, and not only just raising issues, I think it's more important to try and make an attempt to fix those issues. So try and make an attempt to fix those issues, raise a PR, try and see if you can do some improvements on this. I think just 
in the course of me doing this talk, I found, I was just obviously playing through a couple of GitHub libraries and I found there were so many opportunities for me to contribute back in terms of improving their code. Simple things, you know, like uh, dependencies missing out of package.json, just go and add those dependencies in. Or as simple as your npm start script is not probably using nodemon, make it use nodemon. So very simple things, do very small, small things, but start contributing back to the open source community because unless you do that, uh, the core people who are maintaining those repositories probably getting burnt out trying to just answer all your issues. So that's one. If you are getting started with open source, uh, the talk was happening down there, it was really meant for movement. But otherwise, there's a very nice article on Medium by Ken C. Dodds which says, first time was only, go and have a look at that. He talks about how you can start contributing to open source. And also in GitHub, go and look out for these tags called first time was only, beginners or help wanted. So pretty much a lot of libraries out there, Webpack and Angular and so many more, they have tasks which are simple, which are more, you know, which new people can go in and start working on. Go and search for those particular tags, fork those repos, see if you can make any contributions and send keep raising PRs. I think that will really help us grow as a great open source community. And that's about it from my end. We will take questions. Yep, one here. Yeah. I still can't hear you. Hello. Yeah. Yep. Better. So, uh, so this is about probably the demerits of GraphQL. How we can, you know, get into trouble with using GraphQL. So, in typical ERP applications, we want to authorize. <coughs> so, as if someone has rolled this, he can only uh, see these fields. Correct. And he can only. Uh, this is an item potent call because this is put. In GraphQL, how do you handle those things? And sometimes it probably becomes an overkill if you are using GraphQL for such applications. I think GraphQL makes sense uh, when you are, you've done something like give me all the comments for this user ID and then for that comment give me the user ID and for that user ID give me all the likes. So where the schema is more dynamic. But in applications you want to restrict what the user wants. Like you will say that once a user uh, hits this I'll only give him yep. the specified response. So what are your views on this? So I would kind of disagree a little bit saying you cannot use GraphQL for enterprise applications. You can, but to answer your question with regard to how, so I think your question is more with regard to how can I selectively show certain fields to a user based on the type, right? Yeah, so, so uh, what you can do with GraphQL is, so there are directives called skip or include. So I can say at the rate skip or at the rate include and I can mark certain fields for that. So, you know, for example, you can use query fragments. The classic example was a public and private. So, there is a public pro private profile. I can put it under a directive saying at the rate include and I say if that user category or a boolean is set to true, only then include these fields. So, even though it's a part of my query, it will not render it unless my condition is set on the top. So, that is possible with GraphQL, selectively showing fields. Uh, the other question was with regard to, sorry, I, Yes. So, yes. So your GraphQL sort of gives you access to all the schemas that are available. But then the person who's building an API for you. So if you look at it, the person who's building an API, he or she also has access to the entire database in a certain way. So, so the same person is the one who's kind of transferring onto GraphQL. So I wouldn't. Uh... But then, like I said, if you look at the example that I showed you, the authorization, you could still have authorization on your microservices layer. So even though you have that field in GraphQL you could still reject that at your microservices layer or on your actual core application layer. That's still there. We have time yeah. for one more question. Hi. So I am new to GraphQL. So, um, and I would like to know a little more about the uh, server side deployment. Uh, that's, that's what I would, I would like to know. Right. Um, so one of the, one of the. When you say server side deployment, do you mean languages or how are they deployed? Yeah, yeah. So, so specifically like 
can a can a single server also cater to graphene as well as rich base calls or that has to be a dedicated service no they would be different servers they so would be different. yes they would be different and servers. um how how do they interface with database so like i said in graphql when you have a resolver function inside huh. the resolver function you could write whatever code that you want to return back. So if you want to write code to hit a MongoDB database okay. or to hit an end rest API and bring it back, you can do that. Okay, so it's nothing to do with graphene as such. No, okay. so graphene, no, nothing. When okay. you, say, when you say graphene. A graphene or, or graphql. Or graphical. Graphql, yeah. So graphql is like the server language. Graphene is, I think, is an open source tool that allows, is similar to graphql actually. Mm -hmm. so I think a product of graphql. Yeah, I, yeah. I think that's just a spin off of Oh. Yes, it's a GraphQL implementation on one of those languages. I think I have that somewhere on my list. Yeah, so that's a Python port of GraphQL. Yeah, that's there. Yeah, and uh, so it is just it works just like GraphQL. It is a GraphQL server. Yeah. yeah. Um, another thing is, uh, can you show me a, a realistic request? Not, not just the payload. I think this might be something better taken offline so yeah. that we can sure. let everybody go so home. You, so, <laughs> you want, so you want to see how a network call looks like with a graph? Yes, yes, yes. Sure, I can show that. It's essentially just a post with an object attached to your URL. So even a query, query is going to be a post. I'm sorry? So even a query is the query going to be a post. Please catch yes. up with Vinci okay. after yeah. the talk. Thank you very much. <laughs>